Well, there weren't any food courts in 1954 when this episode of I Love Lucy first aired. According to good old Wikipedia, the first food court opened in New Jersey in 1974. If you want to get the story behind why Lucy and Ricky and Ethel and Fred ended up running two different restaurants in the same diner, well, you can watch the whole episode. I have put it on Moodle, but we, alas, need to move on. So, what's wrong with selling one-cent hamburgers? The guy was willing to buy a hundred of them, right? The answer, of course, is that even McDonald's can't figure out how to produce a hamburger for one cent. So, the Lukey, Lucy and Ricky food court stall is going to lose money on every hamburger they sell. Total revenue minus total cost is going to produce a negative number, indeed, a very large negative number. And that brings us to the subject of costs. Costs are going to come with a whole lot of modifying adjectives in this course. Fixed costs, variable costs, total costs, average total costs, and the most important of all, drum roll, and you should be able to guess this, marginal costs. For today, I'm going to focus on the two kinds of costs you need to understand in order to finish your food court simulation fixed costs, and variable costs. But to get there, I need to take a detour and talk briefly about what economists call the production function. So the top part of this definition comes from, please forgive me, Wikipedia. The second comes from your textbook. Output means the product. So in the case of the food court, we're talking about the Wildcat Den sub sandwiches or Hunan Walk's lemon chicken. Input means factors of production. Remember that from Unit 1. For the food court, this means, to oversimplify more than a little, the physical facility, the cooking equipment, the people who work there, and the ingredients, or food. So here is a hypothetical production function for a company that produces jeans. It's not a completely implausible example. Back in the late 1800s, the garment industry, that is the mass production of clothing, really took off with the invention of workable sewing machines. In the early days, clothing producers would provide sewing machines and cloth on credit to workers, mostly immigrant women working in their tiny, crowded, airless tenement apartments. Today, we call these sweatshops. So, how many jeans could an immigrant family produce in a small tenement apartment in the short run? That is, without getting a bigger apartment. Labor input is the number of workers. Capital input for the purpose of this is the number of sewing machines. So one worker working with one sewing machine could produce 15 pairs of jeans in a day. Adding a second sewing machine only increases production by five pairs of jeans, and I'm not sure why it would increase production at all. I did not make up the chart. But a second worker added to one sewing machine creates a jump in production from 15 to 34. So 34 genes is the total physical production, and 19 genes, the additional genes produced by adding another worker, is the marginal physical product. We'll get to that definition in a minute on the slide. So note that after that first jump, marginal physical product starts declining. Two workers, according to the chart, can produce more efficiently with a single sewing machine. One cuts and arranges the fabric, for example. The other sews. But more and more workers does not increase production by much, and eventually additional workers causes production to decline. Now, why, why might that be? Well, at some point, they simply get in each other's way. It helps for a while to add a second sewing machine, but eventually marginal product begins to decline again. So here's the data translated into a graph. Uh, since it's a two-dimensional graph, we can only use one input, but the graph still gives us a clearer picture of how output first rises and then levels off and finally declines if just one input, sewing machine operators, is increased. The law of diminishing returns basically just says that you can't keep crowding workers into the same room with a single sewing machine and expect the added production to keep rising at the same rate. There is, however, an important difference between this law, this law of diminishing, if you will, and the law of diminishing marginal utility. I've had students get confused about this, so I'm going to pause and talk about this for a moment. So let's compare these two graphs. On the left, you have a depiction of declining marginal utility, and then from a different source, as you can tell by the different colors, a picture of declining returns or declining marginal physical product, which for some reason is just called the law of diminishing returns in economics. 
So what difference do you see between the marginal utility graph on the bottom left and the marginal product graph uh, on the bottom right? Well, marginal utility goes down with the consumption of a second good. In other words, it consistently declines. Marginal product often goes up initially with added inputs. We just saw that example in the total jeans company. So two workers can make a pair of jeans faster, even with one sewing machine, by dividing up jobs such as cutting and sewing. But both marginal utility and marginal product begin declining at some point, And both will turn negative at some point. For marginal utility, it's what I call the barf point, when I've eaten so many ice cream cones uh, that not only is my ut marginal utility declining, which it always does, uh, but it's turned negative, I throw up. Or in the case of declining marginal physical product, when I have so many workers crowded into a sweatshop, they just get in each other's way and reduce production. And this brings us to the concept of the short versus the long term, which is very important in economics. When I talked about marginal utility, I emphasized that we were measuring utility within a limited time frame. Uh, say, how many ice cream cones I can consume at one sitting, not over multiple days. The terms short and long term are even more important when it comes to cost. So let's go back to my sweatshop shop example. Assume I have a one-year lease on my tenement apartment on New York's Lower East Side. In economic speak, that makes the rent on my apartment a fixed cost. I have to pay it whether or not I'm producing, and it doesn't change with the quantity of production. In the short run, there are only so many workers and sewing machines that I can squeeze into this space. But if business booms, maybe next year I can get a larger space, or I can rent newer, bigger, fancier, technologically advanced sewing machines, or I can purchase an electric fabric cutter, all of these will shift my production function. So here's a graph of a shift in a production function after I get a larger space and technologically more advanced equipment. I could also shift the production function of labor by giving my workers new training or hiring a more skilled workforce. So is my goal to get as high as I possibly can on this production quantity curve? No. My goal is to make a profit. I'm looking for that sweet spot where total revenues minus total costs is the highest possible number. Now, total revenue, oops, sorry, one of those slide glitches. Total revenue is not really under my control. Those irritating consumers won't just keep buying my product at whatever price I want to offer. Fooey on them. Costs are not entirely under my control either. Even sweatshop owners had to pay a high enough wage to persuade people to work for them, even if it was not a very high wage. I can shop around for a good price on a sewing machine rental, but the rental company is in the business of making profits too. One cent sewing machines are about as improbable as one cent hamburgers. But I do have some control over the number of inputs. That is, how many workers I hire, how many bolts of denim I buy, maybe how many sewing machines I rent, if we are talking about a very short-term rental. The costs I've just mentioned, the ones that I can change in the short run and vary with how much I'm producing, are variable costs. In the short run, I can only change my variable costs. What I can't really control in the short run are fixed costs. Factories do not rent by the day. Big industrial sewing machines are probably leased by the year as well. I mention this because the distinction be between what is and isn't a fixed cost when it comes to equipment can be confusing. Uh, and, and so therefore what a variable cost is not, is, is not always obvious. I will try to make it obvious on any questions that I ask. So here are the total cost table for my jean sweatshop. By the way, I hope you all realize I'm being deliberately provocative when I use that term. There are very good reasons why sweatshops were pretty much outlawed and replaced by factories. Since the table gives a daily rental fee for sewing machines, we're going to call this a variable cost. In uh, the problems you're going to get from me, equipment is in fact going to be a fixed cost. That's a little confusing. Um, it's just I have to use the resources I have here on my slides. So this makes sense for a sweatshop. Sewing machines are light and reasonably portable. A sweatshop operator might actually be able to vary the machines available each day depending on desired output. The operator's wages are also being treated as a variable cost. In real life, businesses 
often can't change wages, which are governed by contract, but they can hire or fire workers. And there actually are businesses that hire on a daily basis. Some construction firms, for example, operate that way, at least for lower skilled, lower paid jobs. Clearly, denim is a variable cost. How much denim my business needs depends entirely on how many pairs of jeans I choose to produce. So you knew this was coming. The factor cost, a hundred, oops, there we go. A uh, hundred dollars a day is a fixed cost. Everything else is variable and goes up as production goes up. Never quite sure when these slides are going to continue building. Okay, there we go. Let's work a few problems. You'll take a practice quiz right after this lecture and we'll stay up on Moodle as always with unlimited attempts. So what is the marginal fiscal product of the third worker? Total production goes from 32 dozen cookies with two workers to 53 dozen cookies with three workers. So marginal physical product is 21, or actually 21 dozen. Here's the entire chart filled in. When does the law of diminishing returns kick in? When, in other words, does marginal physical product begin to decline with the hiring of which worker? And be careful to keep these two straight. It's like utility. You have two different answers. With which worker does marginal physical product actually turn negative? Well, for this particular chart, marginal physical product goes up with the first, second, and third worker, but begins to decline with the fourth. Marginal physical, physical product sorry, actually turns negative with the seventh worker. So here's a cost table for the McConnell cookie factory. What are my fixed costs? So my fixed costs are the lease on the building, the lease on the oven, uh, that's why I identified it as a yearly lease, uh, and the property taxes for a total of $80. What are the variable costs and what are my total costs? Pretty easy. Variable costs are ingredients and labor, or $125 a day. My total costs are my fixed costs plus my variable costs, or $205. So this isn't hard. It gets a little tougher in my next cost lecture. So let me give a warning. Some of you are going to hear that lecture and take a practice quiz before the long weekend. And then you're going to take the real quiz when you get back. Some of you probably will not be here just before the long weekend. You're going to want to review this material, review that quiz, and if you miss the class, you want to listen to that podcast and take the practice quiz. We don't have time to completely revamp the course uh, to deal with the fact that nobody feels like working right before or right after a long weekend, probably myself included. So I'm going to stop here. The examples and slides I've used come from Chapter 5 of the old textbook, but the concepts of production function and marginal product and law of diminishing returns are well explained in your textbook from pages 80 to 86. Fixed and variable costs are also well explained on pages 105 through 108. So let's return to the food court simulation. I made a change in Moodle to improve your odds of getting a good score on your final choice of food court restaurants. You can make a second attempt at the total revenue quiz. Really, that's just inputting data from your chart, right? And I'm also allowing a seven, second attempt on the quiz based on the cost chart that you will fill out today. If you get the costs and revenues wrong, you will get the answers wrong. So check your quizzes and redo them if you miss some of the numbers. I set the quiz function so that you will know if you missed an answer, but the right answer will not come up yet. I also, by the way, left them open-ended. So if you don't finish, don't submit, just resume when you have a chance. Today, you're going to be filling out a cost form. Also, of course, if you haven't finished your total revenue form, you want to do that. So here is what it looks like. Notice that you need a cost for each price. So how do you find that? You use the cost data sheet. I've got a picture of part of it here. And you'll also receive this today. Note that it is divided between fixed and variable costs. Stall and equipment rental are treated as fixed costs. In the short run, these can't change. So even though no one will buy meat tacos for $10, Taco Villa is still going to have to pay out $30 for stall and equipment rental. Not a smart business move. Variable costs, on the other hand, will depend on how much each restaurant produces. So, for example, at a price of $6, the roastery would sell, you can see this from your chart, your demand chart, 
eight chicken entrees. The cost of producing eight chicken entrees is $30. That's the fixed costs, plus $2.55 per serving, $0.40 cents for labor, and $2.15 for ingredients. And that means a total cost of $50.40. That's $30 fixed cost plus $2.55 times eight. By the way, this is a very efficient thing to do with partners if one of you is doing the calculations and one of them is putting it into the graph. Your last stage of this exercise will be putting it all together by finding total profits, and you'll find total profits by subtracting these total costs from the total revenues that you found last class or at the beginning of the, or after this podcast is over. That's the part you will finish up in the last two classes of the quarter. You may work with your partners on this, and I actually don't mind if you consult with other groups to check your numbers. I'm perfectly happy to give the entire class a perfect score on this exercise, which does count as a test, but I do not want you just copying each other's worksheets. And I have given Mr. Malonis and Mr. Jones free reign to collect worksheets that where that's what's happening. You're not going to do that, right? It would defeat the purpose of the exercise. You wouldn't learn how a business makes a profit, which is a good thing to learn, even if you don't care about your grade in concurrent uh, economics. Uh, and one other ho housekeeping note, I will finalize grades for this class on Friday morning. Friday evening, I fly to Turks and Caicos for spring break, for Stanford spring break, which is not, of course, Juan Diego spring break. Lucky me. But if you have not made up missing work or finished this exercise, which will all be set up on Moodle, unlucky you. Likewise, if you have not worked out any missing work with Mr. Johnson, uh, it's not going to be good news. So take care of business, okay, and then enjoy your long weekend.